Hi, uh, my name is Shane. I use she and her pronouns. Uh, welcome to the first of four sessions in a game of Apocalypse Keys uh, by the Gauntlet's own Jamila Najadi. We're going to be using the rules from the open playtest that Evil Hat Games is running at the moment. We'll talk more about Apocalypse Keys uh, a little later, but briefly, it's a game about emotionally conflicted monsters holding back the apocalypse. Um, I was just rereading the rules yesterday to get ready to run this session, and I'm just so excited. I think it's like a really cool, evocative game. Um, I'm really excited to dig in and subject you all to the emotional and supernatural horrors that the game will present. Um, I also have my thematically appropriate uh, teacup. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, it's a love heart that says you bring out the devil in me. Uh, this game was organized through the Gauntlet gaming calendar. Gauntlet is a community that plays and discusses all kinds of story games, indie games, OSR type role-playing games. If you'd like to find out more or get involved, you can check us out at gauntlet-rpg.com. And we would also love for you to come and play with us um, Coming up at the end of June, we have a Gauntlet Community Open Gaming Weekend, where a bunch of Gauntlet GMs will be running uh, all free uh, one or two shot games. That's a great opportunity to get involved in if you're interested. So check out the website and I'll post a link in the YouTube uh, bit. That said, I'm gonna ask my players to introduce themselves now. Uh, if you just wanna tell us your name, your pronouns, anything that you want to tell us about yourself, and specifically would love to hear uh, just briefly why you wanted to play Apocalypse Keys or what you're excited about in this game. So we'll go around the order that I can see you on my screen, so starting with Matthew. Hi, I'm Matthew. I go by he, him pronouns. I am a erstwhile uh, video game critic and media commentator. Uh, I wanted to play Apocalypse Keys because um, my partner and wife will not stop talking about it because they designed the game. <laughs> so I have been I have been living with this game for a better part of a year. <laughs> um, I now uh, I must remind you that uh, even though uh, uh, they're my partner, I do not know the rules like the back of my hand. <laughs> they only exist in an abstract sense in the form of late night questions and discussions of like where to go with the game <laughs> and yeah but um why i want to play other than of course uh, bias is uh you know uh i share the same love for for for, for monster for high for high drama high action and creepy crawlies um so you know this stuff is this stuff is absolutely my jam Cool. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you can't tell Jamie when I inevitably fuck up the rules multiple times during the Don't game. Don't worry, I, I won't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that works, that's fine. <laughs> um, great. Uh, Drew? I'm Drew, I use he, him pronouns. I am a uh, fledgling creator for RPGs, and uh, I've been a Hellboy fan for a long time, and I've heard such good things about this game, so I am really excited to to get into it and play with y'all. Right. John? Hey everyone, I'm John. I use he, him pronouns. Um, yeah, I, I was interested in playing the game because it's gotten amazing reviews from everyone on the gauntlet. Also, Jamie is a fantastic designer, so I enjoy everything by them. And I, I love, you know, apocalyptic style games. So I think Matthew described it perfectly. High action, high drama. It sounds right up my alley. All right, uh, and Josh. Yeah, hi, I'm Josh. I use he and pronouns. Uh, I wanted to play this game because I really enjoy the Hellboy comics that I have read. Um, I haven't read a lot of Hellboy, but I really do like the stuff I have. Um, and I, I love Jamie's work, and I wanted to see a little bit about how Apocalypse Keys actually does in playtest, and not just sort of in my <laughs> weird you know, mental palace of me never uh, having read or played the game and only knowing the name. Hmm. All right, great. So uh, I'm going to start out just with a, a CATS procedure to talk about expectations and boundaries. Um, CATS stands for Concept, Aim, Tone, and Subject Matter. Uh, it, it sounds like you're all pretty clear on the concept, but basically uh, it's a game about emotionally conflicted monsters holding back the apocalypse. It's essentially structured as an investigation game, so you're going to be collecting clues that are called keys, and you're going to be trying to determine 
Uh, you'll be sent out on cases by an organization called Division, and you'll be trying to figure out who is the harbinger of the apocalypse and what is the door that they are trying to open to end the world. Um, we'll talk more about the, the specifics of how the mechanics work as we get into the game. Um, AIM today, I'm going to finish up this intro pretty quickly, talk about safety tools, then we'll make characters, uh, we'll do some sort of setting creation stuff. Um, I think probably the bulk of today will be character and setting creation, but we're also definitely expecting to get you into your first mystery. We'll take short breaks roughly on the hour, and we have, I think, four sessions on the calendar for the game, and I hope that'll be enough time for you to save the world at least once, maybe a couple of times, uh, just depending how we go. Tone, um, just reading from the game text now, the intended tone of Apocalypse Keys is one of mystery, supernatural horror, and facing a possible apocalypse head on. However, the heart of the game is built on hope, defiance, and emotional connection. So the tone does include a fair bit of emphasis on emotions and potentially romance. So if that's not something that you want to explore in the game, of course, that's fine. Um, but we'll talk about uh, subject matter and safety tools here, and there'll be a, a chance for you to flag that. So subject matter wise, game does lean towards horror, so may include violence, and that could include gore and body horror. Some concepts in the game lean into experiences that can parallel racism and other kinds of marginalization. And the mystery that we're gonna to start today includes references to smoking and alcohol. If you wanna have a look sort of in more detail at some of this stuff, um, in the Google folder that I shared with you, there's a more detailed CATS document for the game. And in particular, I draw your attention to the part under subject matter there that details some of the potentially difficult themes that are associated with each of the playbooks that you'll be choosing from. Um, so keep those in mind if there are particular themes that you'd like to avoid for your character. Uh, in particular. We're also going to be using, of course, some safety tools in the game. Firstly, the X card. If anything comes up in the game that you're not comfortable with, that's not fun for you for any reason, um, you can say the words X card, you can type an X in the chat, you can make an X with your hands. Um, any way that you want to signal that, we'll just take out that content, uh, we'll work, or work around it. Um, that's absolutely no problem. Secondly, we have the open door which is just to say that if you need to leave, you're absolutely welcome to. That can be to step away from your computer or device um, for a quick break, or it can be just to, to leave the game entirely if it's not what you were wanting to play. Um, all of those things, totally fine. The third safety tool that we're gonna be using is one that sort of comes with Apocalypse Keys. Um, it has its own safety tool called Green, Yellow, and Red. And if I could get you to open up the Character Keeper if you haven't already, You'll see that the first tab there is called Safety First and Dice Room. And you'll see that's got headings there for green, yellow, and red, where green is sort of content that you're excited to explore in the game. Yellow is content that you'd like to see less of in the game. Uh, that's pretty similar to, to veils, if you're familiar with lines and veils as a safety tool. So things that might be included in the story but aren't going to be a focus that will sort of skip over quickly or fade to black on. And red is content that we just don't want included in the game at all. Uh, so I'll give you a sec here just to have a read through those. I've already put in some of my own personal uh, yellow and reds. And fill out anything that you'd like to add there. And then if you could just put an OK in the chat so I know when you're finished. All right. So I'm just going to read through the lists of what we've got together so we're all on the same page. Um, Green, we have being an outcast slash discrimination. Um, I'm sure that we will get that content in, uh, no concerns there. Um, for yellow, so for, for theme stories and ideas we want to see less of, uh, we've got sexual content, torture, and suicide slash self-harm. Oh, and someone's just added torturous romance in the green tab. Um, so I'm sure that that is also something we can include. Um, under red for things that we just won't have in the game, we have sexual violence, cancer, plagues and pandemics, medical injustice, fat phobia, transphobia, incest, and gendered violence. Um, so yeah, again, living document, anytime that you want to add or change something that's on there, that's totally fine. Um, if something comes up in the game and, you know, the first time or few times that it happens, you let it go, um, but it starts to bother you, you're, you're totally welcome to, you know, reconsider. You're not bound to uh, allow something just because you let it go through one time. Um, 
Also, just bearing in mind that everyone's responsible for safety at the table, so it's always welcome to check in about any of those things. Um, if it seems like they might be coming up, um, please, you know, let us know. Uh, it seems like we're getting close to one of our yellow topics or, or red topics. That's very welcome. Um, and in particular, if anyone makes a visual X, like types an X or, or a hand X or something like that, I often won't be watching the video while I'm running the game. So if someone can verbalize that, it'll really help me out. That is uh, my sort of intro spiel. Does anyone have questions about any of that before we start making characters? Cool. So, making characters is reasonably straightforward. Um, in the Character Keeper, there's a there are tabs. There's a separate tab for each playbook. Um, one for the character details and one for the sort of optional moves that you can pick. I think is the way it's organised. Um, so, have a look at those tabs along the Character Keeper. Um, the ones that have the word player in brackets are the ones with the sort of character details on them. Each one has a paragraph of flavor text about that playbook uh, at the top. And then if you look down the left-hand side, you'll see pick lists for both, uh, well, for a bunch of things. But two of those to uh, particularly have a look at when you're figuring out what playbook you'd like. Uh, one is the powers of darkness that that playbook can choose. And the other is what the darkness demands of them. Those together will probably give you a pretty good idea of the kind of themes and play style of that playbook. Um, does anyone already know which playbook they want? Matthew? I'm, I am, I have played, I have goofed around to summon before, so now my eye is leaning towards um, the Surge or the Fallen. Sorry, the Shade. The Surge or the Shade. So, um, Death Boy or Power Boy or Girl <laughs> You know, feature. <laughs> cool. Um, anyone else have their eye on something? I, I have my eye on the same too. So I, I think <laughs> which one you don't take is the one I, I'll go for. <laughs> um, Drew, have you thought about what playbook you'd like? I th I'm thinking the found right now. Cool. Uh, and Josh. Yeah, um, I also had my eye on the shade, but I'm very happy to leave that to you two and let you two fight for that one. <laughs> so I will. Uh, I think that actually, I. No, I do need a minute. Um, yeah, yeah, my, of course. Not, not to put, uh, not to straight jack at any of the playbooks but my impression of course has always been that the summoned is the one that most closely resembles the hellboy that was uh, all yeah. I take just from looking just from skimming it yeah you know i'm gonna take the i'll take the surge The shade it is, then. Yes. All right. In that case, <laughs> uh, I am going to take the... I'm between the summoned and the fallen. I, I think I'll take the fallen. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. All right. Cool. So... It should be pretty easy for you all. I assume you've all played plenty of PBTA games before, um, which basically is um, just go through the pick list, choose the options there. Um, each playbook is going to give you one uh, standard move for that playbook. Uh, you're also going to choose one of the extra moves, one of the extra standard moves for that playbook. And then as well as that, you have a choice of either one division move or one ruin move depending on whether your organizational ties or your self-destructive tendencies are more central to your character as we start out. Uh, the ruin moves that you can choose are on the, the playbook tab on the keeper and the division moves are all grouped in their own tab separately. So if you're taking division moves, um, just because you all draw from the same pool there, just make sure you're not taking the same division move that someone else has. Um, I'm gonna stop talking for a while. Um, just go through that, make your choices. Um, once everyone's done, we'll do bond questions together. Um, but of course, feel free to sing out if you have any questions or want to check anything. 
I see I'm the last person not tentatively ready, which I, th I think I am. I'm just looking over all the moves, and there's so many options, and they all sound so good. Knowing me, I missed some. Oh, you're muted, Shane. Knowing me, I missed something, but I'm sure we'll discover that miss. <laughs> and I'll be prepared to answer that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I was just saying, take your time. It's There's no rush. I mean, it's basically uh, sort out, like, sort out the pick lists from the left and take a standard move and a ruin move in addition to the starting move, right? Uh, either a ruin move or a division move, depending That's on That's right, or a division move. Do you right. get an, a standard move too? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. I did not take a standard move, so I'm not actually attempting to really. All right. I missed that step. That's cool. So, I I think I'm my mind is maybe drawing too many parallels to like monster of the week. And I'm sitting here thinking like, I don't have a way to fight, but maybe that's not even important in this game. Am I? I mean, you're, you're... so I don't think it will be super important. Like, I don't think you would be struggling too bad if you can't fight, but which playbook are you using? I'm the, the shade. The shade. The, um, so what powers of darkness did you choose? Uh... Let the dead speak in shadow magic. I feel like... Yeah, uh, so, oh, yeah. I forgot about those. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, those powers, like whatever you've chosen, are going to be your sort of main monstrous abilities. And there's yeah. a basic move that lets you use those um, to... What is it? To unleash the dark, to yeah. uh, uh, influence someone uh, either through violence or some other way. Yeah, like my understanding yeah. is, you know, it's very much inspired by masks in that sense so that if you had created a character who you know you pick you pick stuff that wasn't explicitly about combat you know you can still harness those powers to solve certain problems or to get obstacles out of the way yeah gotcha i'm your polar opposite uh john <laughs> And that's kind of what I was thinking. I was like, I'm sure other people probably have this area very well covered, and it doesn't matter. Well, you get you get you get two powers. I only start with one. Ah, uh, um, I'm so I'm actually thinking about taking one of the division moves. I'm thinking about taking the psychic invokers. Ooh. It sounds like um, that doesn't contend with anyone else, possibly. No, I was taking a ruin move, so I did not have to deal with that. But yeah, I took a division move once before, so I and, and I think it's a cool way of flavoring your character as someone with a who's, who's sort of like is able to operate within the parameters of the, of the division. Is there? A way I note that on my sheet, or should I maybe just write uh, my character's name beside that move? Yeah, I think like whatever's useful for you in like you know keeping that information where you you need it. But yeah, I think if you could mark on the division moves page that you've taken that one, so nobody else um, does later, that would be good. I'm gonna test something and see if I can figure something out. Ooh, where am I? Oh, so you can kind of paste it into your own uh, player sheet if you wanted to. Smart. Copy and paste. I didn't think of that. It's been a long day. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I think I'm I'm ready. All right, and uh, Josh, how did you go? Did you find a standard move? Yes, I'm good there. All right, so next thing we're going to do is just get you to introduce your characters. Um, so I think we'll just go left to right across the character keeper. Um, so 
think that will be Matthew first uh, playing the surge. Um, so obviously, by way of introduction, you know your the name and pronouns that your monster uses, um, and the sort of choices that you've made during character creation. So we all know a bit about you. And then I think once we've all introduced our characters, we'll go back and do the bond questions, um, which sort of establish relationships a bit more. So go ahead, tell us about the surge. Yeah, uh, I'm still working on a name. You know how I am, uh, Shane. Uh, <laughs> Um, the surge um, is the way I visualize this character is someone who uh, has been blessed or cursed with a divine power um, that manifests as angelic fury and beauty, um, and he or he or she has been carrying this power uh, for a long while, um, and he was chosen to wield it to destroy the human world. Um, and so I, you know, I've got that sort of like, um, you know, tortured loner kind of th thing going on. So she dresses in anachronistic clothing, uh, an ever burning cigarette, um, has tattoos that respond to, uh, their emotions. And, um, the, the thing to reflect that, um, that, that curse, um, the darkness is constantly reminding them, uh, to destroy everything around them and um it tries to tempt him tempt them by pulling on his on their, on their pettiness uh like okay you're not gonna you're not gonna destroy the world fine well look at this person you know he offended you in some small way you know now wreak havoc and destruction <laughs> um and yeah that's what i've got so far so kind of fleshing it out but here we go all right, and tell us a bit about the moves that you've chosen. All right, um, the moves I have chosen, um, let's see. Uh, standard move, I am your destruction. You are capable of causing great destruction around you, but sometimes you can thread the needle and use it as a tool. When you power through darkness, you can declare that you cause great collateral damage. If you do, you may choose one from below, even on a miss. Your power destructively reshapes the environment. You are transported to the other side of an ancient door where you uncover a key at great cost, or you draw the attention of the harbinger and they will send a servant to confront you. And um, this is, I think, the juicy one for the ruin move I've chosen is Alpha and Omega. The burden of power can be carried between two should fate choose to be so kind. When you take this move, declare a character you are bound to by fate. If they agree, they declare what shared fate awaits you both. The two of you are connected always, sharing emotions, thoughts, and unable to stray too far from each other. When you deepen the connection between you two, choose to mark ruin to have them appear by your side, or mark ruin to change a small but significant aspect of your shared fate to bring it closer to ruin. Yes, fall into the abyss with me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let us be like let, let us be like let us be like Mads Mickelson and Hugh Dancy and jump into a pit. <laughs> Oh, uh, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, Drew, tell us about The Found. The Found goes by Z the name Zero and uh, uses he, him pronouns. And uh, his look, he has scars from a time he cannot remember, a haunted aura and red gold eyes. And he was found in an abandoned facility that performed cruel experiments. Uh, and most of his memories were replaced with a shivering sense of loss and a yawning abyss of nothingness. <laughs> oh his uh, powers of darkness are telekinesis, telepathy, and mind blasts. And the darkness demands that he destroy his friends before they destroy him and to open a permanent portal to a dark realm. And I chose the uh, move Walk With Me in Dreams. Uh, over the years, you have learned how to travel through the portals that connect all dreamers, even locations, objects, and harbingers dream. When you seek out insider wisdom and dreams, spend darkness tokens and roll. And I can learn something significant, uh, implant suggestions, hide something in a dream, or uh, bring back something from a dream if it goes well. Cool. And I took the ruin move, uh, crowned by dream, exalted by nightmare. I might have a theme here. Uh, 
You've learned how to harness dreams and create great and terrible weapons from them. When you take dreams and turn them into a dangerous weapon, mark ruin and choose uh, details about the weapon. Cool. Um, that sounds great. Uh, John, tell us about the shade. Yes, the shade is Kronos Cerberus, who uses he, him pronouns. Um, his name is one that conveys knowledge and history. So basically, Kronos is, um, was born in ancient Greek times. It was a, um, a medium who was not allowed to die. And maybe we'll understand and learn more about why as we go. Um, but their look now is uh, a vaporous body contained by a suit. So they, they have lost their body and are in a vapor at this point. Um, that they carry a symbol that proves their soul belongs to another. Um, as I said, the origin was a famous medium who lost their body in a terrible accident. Um, so death takes the form of they appear to me in reflective surfaces and, and look as Kronos did before uh, their death. Um, let's see what else. I think moves, right? Uh, and also just what the darkness demands of you. Oh yeah, so uh, the darkness demands that I kill death <laughs> and that I break the veil between the living and the dead. Amazing. Easy. Um, so for moves, I have Soul Like a Steel Trap, which is uh, your cold analytical skills can help you devise the perfect plan. So when you study a tense situation, you can get tokens and um, start forming a plan. Um, then I chose Death Walked here. So death reaches all places and into the heart of all things. When you seek to reconstruct events or learn something valuable in an area, spin tokens and roll and learn about uh, what has transpired in the area. And then I took a division move. So I took the division move, Psychic Invokers, uh, because I'm thinking Kronos has been part of the division for probably a very long time, um, seeing as that they're very old. Uh, so the division has trained a number of psychics to attune to an agent, sharing their visions across vast distances and directly into the mind of an agent in the field. This connection has been deemed to operate within marginally safe parameters most of the time. You take this move, answer some questions, and I don't know if you want to do that now or in a little bit. Oh, um, we'll do it a bit later. Just remind me that we'll do it when we're like setting up some more stuff about division. Yeah, um, sounds good. A little later. Cool. Uh, all right. And Josh, tell us about The Fallen. Of course. Uh, so I'm playing The Fallen. The Fallen's name is Asag, uh, which is not their real name, but it is what you call them. Um, Asag does not, Asag uses they, them pronouns, um, but does not like using any pronouns. Asag would rather be referred to as Asag at all times because Asag is not, you know, is a god. Um, they, they fell from their divinity. They were once a mighty god of this earth, but they were killed by their worshipers. Um, and they're still taunted by the divine servants who remained behind and, and who grew in power when the vacuum that left behind in Asag's fall. Um, Asag's look, uh, they, they look like a, like a, they look like a tall uh, person, you know, very tanned, um, very beautiful, but in a, like a very intimidating way. Uh, they do not have any fashion sense. Their clothing is very mismatched. Um, it's just sort of baggy and covering. Uh, and when they take it off, you would see that on it, almost every inch of their body is, are eyes of all different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, and that is sort of what they cover behind this mismatched baggy clothing, uh, except for a spot in the small of their back where they can't reach, uh, where there is a brand sort of burnt into there. Um, and the, if any of you are demonologists, you would know the brand is, has a demon's mark. Uh, Asag has two powers. Their powers are soul venom and fear manipulation. 
uh, you're a very, very nice person. And <laughs> the darkness demands that they storm heaven and kill all of the gods. Uh, and they are not totally averse to that suggestion. Uh, they they do not like, the, you know, the way that they have been uh, targeted. They do not like the, the being stripped of their of their godhood. Uh, and I think it is a very tempting suggestion every time they hear that voice in their head. Uh, but they but they know that they are too weak. Simply, if they tried to return to heaven uh, and and stage this coup, they would certainly be killed. And they would suffer a worse fate, even than when they were killed by their worshippers or when they were bound by the division. So, that is their story. Were they a um, god of like a petite? Like, did they have a? You know, I'm thinking of D and D. Did they have a domain? Like, what were they the god of? They were. Uh, I think that they were a they monotheistic god, okay. right? Or wow. not, not monotheistic. Um, what is the word? They were. They were the only recognized god of their group of worshippers. Yeah. Uh, but I think that they were a cruel god, and that is why they were sort of thrown down, because other people had other gods at the time, uh, and and they realized we don't have to, to deal with, you know, the, the tyrant god, Asag, and they ripped down Asag and, and branded them with this demon's mark, uh, which was the start of Asag's rough years. <laughs> Yes, the, the demon brand, typically the start of some rough years. Uh, my moves are, I have, I start with call me master. No one can resist the call of my dark heart, not for long anyway. So when I mes I can declare how I mesmerize on looking NPCs with my faded power uh, and roll to take advantage of them. I took the move Honeyed Tongue and Clouded Minds. Uh, I have only survived in this wretched state thanks to my ability to lie and charm. So when I choose to unleash the dark through lies, I get something, even if I fail. Um, I, I get a little boost out of it. And I took a ruin move called I Will Rise Again, which grants me this, uh, the secret sheet reclaiming glory and power and I'm not going to share any more because it is explicitly called a secret sheet. Um, <laughs> but but it is called I Will Rise Again. So there's your hand. <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right. Look, I think this would be a good time to take our first break and then we'll come back and do our bonds and build division and things like that. So let's just come back about two minutes past the hour, if that's good for everyone. Of course. Shane, Sorry. there are very useful things for you on the secret sheet. So you should probably take a look. But, All right, I will. That's and exciting. everyone is, of course, willing. They're welcome to look at the secret <laughs> sheet, but it, it does say secret, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be coy about it. Amazing, thank you. So I'm thinking for my ruin move, Alpha and Omega. I am eyeing either John or Josh to be my Omega. No, to be my Alpha, because obviously I'm the Omega. <laughs> What what is the alpha? The uh, the alpha and omega. Um, the burden of power can be carried between two should fate choose to be so kind. When you take this move, declare a player character or non-player character. You are bound to by fate. If they agree. <laughs> they declare that what shared fate awaits you both. The two of you are connected always, sharing emotions, thoughts, and unable to stray too far from each other. When you deepen the connection between you two, you can choose to mark a ruin to have them appear by your side, defying logic or plausibility, though they may have suffered to do so, or mark ruin to change a small but significant aspect of your bond to bring you closer to ruin. If you do, immediately gain one bond with them and one bond on what the darkness demands of you. Who's ready to fall with me? <laughs> um, I, I wonder if we, it might be easier to figure out if we do bonds first and establish some relationships with, between the characters and then we can look at the, the, uh, the, the sort of move specific uh, connections. Curse uh, you and your sensibility. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, is everyone good to um, start making some bonds now? 
Yeah. So you, you've probably seen, but all of you will find on your tab in the Character Keeper that you have three questions for starting bonds. Um, two of them are going to be questions that you direct towards one of the other player characters. And the third is about why you are tempted to give in to what the darkness demands. So uh, I think we'll just go around again, just in the order of the, the tabs on the Character Keeper. Um, and we'll leave the one about why why you're tempted to give in until last. And we'll just start in whatever order you want with the, the questions for other monsters. So when you address that question to someone, um, they will get to answer it. Uh, or you can kind of answer it collaboratively between the two of you. And then you'll gain a bond with them. And bonds are a kind of resource that you're able to spend in play to modify dice rolls. So that's, that's the kind of mechanical benefit from them. Um, so, Matthew, would you like to go first? And, uh, or Sebastian, okay. Yes, uh, uh, Sebastian will be asking, you were there when I truly let go. What did I destroy that belonged to you? And why are you grateful? And I would like to pose that question to Zero. I think that, sorry, uh, it's something of mine that you destroyed? Yes. Okay. Right. Um, I think you destroyed I think you destroyed Division's files on me. And I am thankful for that because it will allow me to forge my own identity. Oh. So not only are you an amnesia, but there are no records of you as well. Right. Awesome, awesome. I like that. I will. I always get confused about this, Shane, so gain one bond with them. Do I write that down or do they write that down? <laughs> Great question. I believe that you write that down. Um, All right. So on the bond, on the first row, bond one, I write yes. in Hero's name. All right. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, and we'll we'll go around, and I'll come back to you for your second question. Um, cool, 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 but, cool, 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 cool. Uh, Drew, do you want to do one of Zero's starting bonds? Sure. Um... Can I ask the group, like, does anyone think that their monster would have been with Division for a while? Yeah, I think Kronos has. Okay, well, Kronos, you were there when I was found. Why do you either pity or admire me? Hmm, that's a good one. I think I pity you um, because of, and tell me if this is good with you, because of the damage, the physical damage done to you. That works. Thank you. Cool. Uh, John, what's, what is your character's first bond going to be? I will go with, um, let's just start from the top. You were there when I died. How did witnessing my death transform our relationship? And I feel like probably the person that would have been there where Kronos, the ancient Greek died, would be the god. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, well, you were mortal before you died. Uh, and, and I think that witnessing your death actually greatly increased uh, my respect for you, because now you are you are better than human in the eyes of Asag. Uh, maybe not a shared view, but makes sense. I'm not human anymore, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just appreciate the divine hubris that uh, Josh is already radiating as he, as he as he sips from his beverage. Yes, thank you. I try. <laughs> All right, uh, and Josh, what's your first bond? Uh, well, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna 
rebound that right back onto you, John. Uh, you made sure my fall was swift and terrible. Why don't I hate you for it? Wow. Because it it wasn't just you that fell in the process. It was um, you, one of your arch rival gods fell alongside you. And I'll let you <laughs> define who that who that might be. Um, Josh, do you have an idea about who your rival god who fell with you might have been? Uh, I can make up a name if you give me a minute, but I will... I Yeah, I think that... Uh, I, I think that, that this whole... Like, the area that Asaga is from, let's say, somewhere in the Mediterranean, um, there, there were uh, there was Sag and another god were both competing right for the the people in this in this region's uh, worship and etc. And I think that you know, Kronos, uh, we were both Asag and the other god were branded and sort of thrown down um, with the help of Kronos. And while on a personal level, Asag is obviously not happy with this. Uh, there, there is a, a, a tactical, you know, there is some part of a song tactically that has to think, well, you know, I'm great, so I will, I will rebound from this. Uh, but you have just eliminated my enemy from consideration. I never have to worry about them again. They're lying at the bottom of a river somewhere, you know, and have been for 3,000 years, and I'm free. So, <laughs> so I, do, I do have a lot of respect there. Although I have not been keeping track on them for 3,000 years, so who knows where they are. <laughs> yeah, surely that will never become a problem. Yeah. The, um, John, I love that you went from I'm not sure if I have any ways to fight to I threw down two gods uh, from heaven. I, I'm imagining that it was probably less of like Kronos did the throwing and more of a like uh, shared some sort of you know prophetic medium like proclamation and, and mm -hmm. you know, the, the powers that be in the universe cast out a sog in this other one. Who knows? Yeah. Nice. Um, so let's go now back the other direction. So Josh, do you want to do um, a sog's second, second bond? Sure. Uh, so, yeah. So a sog's second bond is you long to worship me. Your heart yearns for me. Why do I keep my distance from you? Uh, and I think that I'm going to say, Drew, that this makes sense for the found, if you think it makes sense. Or Matthew. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, Matthew. You're raising your hand. It's yours. Take it. Um, so you worship me, and I keep my distance, or you long to worship me. Why do I keep my distance from you? Please tell me. Well, um, I didn't really go into it during, earlier during establishing my characters, but now I've got a better idea, which is that I think Sebastian had a god back in the olden days. We're talking like Aztec days, right? And that god was deposed, destroyed. You know, we'll leave it, we'll leave it open to like development or not at all. And so um, he wanders the earth, godless, basically. And that's why, you know, he's driven by wrath and, you know, all this darkness that wants him to punish the mortal world for the destruction of his god. And that in turn means that when he sees Asag, he's like, oh, here is a god that I can, like, you know, I can, I can look up to. And here is someone, you know, who, 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 could be my master, but uh, if I understand what the question you posed to me, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So the I'm looking at is, why do I keep my distance from you? Oh, hmm. Are you opposed to destruction? That's a very good reason, but <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, why? 
I'm looking at your at your at your character. I think maybe you 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 see me as too tainted, too tainted by mortality. That's it. Too tainted by mortals. So this reflects on how you view John, right? It's like yeah, if John is, perfect. yeah, if John's character is like, hey, you're 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 with the cool kids now. <laughs> They're like, oh, you've been hanging out with the normies for too long. That's why you can get distance. Oh, I'm so stoked. <laughs> oh, uh, John, what is Kronos's second bond? So, I, I think this will be for Zero. I love you, but I can't accept it. Why do you allow me to remain ignorant? Could I answer that with a bond? <laughs> because I have the bond, you love me, but I don't understand love. Why won't you give up on me? And those kind of mesh. Whoa. They really Holy do. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, that makes sense. But... I am curious about, um, and honestly, I'm not even sure if the, maybe the question's ambiguous intentionally, the why do you allow me to remain ignorant? I'm not sure entirely what it's referring to, like what, what I would be ignorant of, but maybe if we can, like, what do you think um, Kronos is ignorant of in regards to, to zero? Um. Kronos may not understand the uh, the depths of Zero's lack of understanding. So, like, he looks more normal on the outside than he is, so. Okay, yeah, I like that. All right. Uh, and Zero, I guess we figured out who you're directing your question to, but can you read it out again? Uh, you love me, but I don't understand love. And why won't you give up on me? Um, but actually, is it a problem if I have two bonds with Kronos? Should I spell uh, that out? Or? I mean, it's really for you to say, I guess. Like, do you, I don't think it's a problem mechanically to have multiple bonds with the same person. Um, but if you'd prefer to, to spread them around, you're welcome to do that. I do love a tragic love triangle. So introducing a third is always welcome. Well, in that case, um, John, I'll have to say that, yeah, I agree. I allow you to remain ignorant because uh, it's easier for me to just pretend that I, I know what this means than to... Uh, to actually commit. And I will say that um, Asag loves me, but if, if you're okay with that, Josh. Uh, yeah, sure. But I don't understand that. So we got the triangle. And why won't you give up on me? Uh, I also think that Asag thinks that you Asag is, is convinced that you are also divine. I think they, they sense the spark of divinity in you. Uh, and, you know, they, they want to be close to that. Maybe they're wrong, but, you know. That is what they believe. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. And Matthew, what's Sebastian's last uh, bond? Or oh, sorry, second bond. Well, we might be making a love quadrangle now. Quadrangle. Why did I pronounce that way? Quadrangle. <laughs> um, I love you, but you rejected me for my own sake. Why? And I will pose that question to Kronos. <laughs> Can you repeat it one more time? I love you, but you rejected me for my own sake. Why? <laughs> I rejected you for your own sake. 
Um, so I think that probably has more to do with, I just don't see how I could, how I could reciprocate. And so it's, it feels like a dead end. What do you mean by reciprocate? Like in terms of having relation, in terms of like having sustained relationship sexually? Um... I, I, I think more just in um, the ability to empathize and, and be there as a, as a partner. Mm, all right, all right. Oh, so I think that the last Bond question for all of you is gonna be the same. Why are you tempted to give in to what the darkness demands? Uh, and this establishes a bond with what the darkness demands that you can draw on in the same way during play. Um, so let's go back the other way again. So Sebastian, why are you tempted? I mean, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> I'm going to, you know, revenge on the mortal world, yet wanting to save it, you know, all of that stuff. It's just all mixed up, you know. Like if, if, if you know, if, if, if Hellboy is all like, well, you know, I should destroy the world because it's my destiny. I can't resist. I can't. I have to, you know, rejecting it is just like cosmically wrong. You know, none of that comes into play for Sebastian. It's just a matter of like, you know, humanity deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's also been with humanity for too long to really, really fully commit, you know. Nice. So it's, it's almost more of a question of why do you not just give in to the temptation? <laughs> Maybe we should rephrase that question. <laughs> just for me. <laughs> Um, all right. What about zero? Zero is tempted to give into the dark to what the darkness demands to uh, find the answers to who he used to be. Oh. Uh, what about uh, Kronos? Uh, Kronos is tempted to give into what darkness demands because after that he can rest. Nice. Uh, and Asag, maybe you answered this already, but is there anything that you want to say here? Yeah, Asag is, is of course, tempted to give into what the darkness demands because uh, they they sort of despise this, what they, what they view as their reduced state, right? They were once so powerful and so beautiful and so, uh, so immaterial. And like, this is just not what they want. Cool. Um, so that is all of our characters, uh, an amazing lineup. Uh, obviously, you know, if, if you decide that the choices that you made like aren't really working for you, especially between sessions, feel free to switch stuff around or um, whatever you need. The next thing that we're gonna do is establish a bit more about Division, the organization that you all work for that is devoted to preventing the apocalypse. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you some questions about that. Um, feel free to answer it directly, to discuss it with the group, like whatever you want. Um, but let's, oh, where's my list? So uh, Matthew, I think I'll start with you again. Um, where is Division Headquarters located? And are there many branches or just the one? Mm. I think there are many branches. There are um, uh, all over uh, the planet, and you know, some uh, reflecting the great <clears throat> inequality of the world. Some branches are more well, you know, well managed, well financed than others, and others are just, you know, ghetto bureaus in their ghetto towns. Yeah. Um, is there one that the four of you are based out of? Hmm. I feel like there's the answer to that question. Is something should be mutually decided because it really says something about 
where our campaign would be, but uh, unless you had something in mind, Shane. No, I don't. I mean, the the mysteries that we're or the cases that we're going to deal with will take you sort of around the world, regardless of where you you set yourselves. Um, so it, it's it, like anything that you decide there is fine. Um, I, I guess it makes sense to me, you know, given that your relationships are so intertwined that you are all based out of the same place. But I yeah. have no specific preference about where that would be. All right. In that case, I volunteered a suggestion of. Um, setting it in, and I'm sure Shane has heard me say this like a bajillion times, um, setting it somewhere in some shady Pacific Northwest, you know, foresty area where there, there's a lot of room for hidden bunkers to be lost amidst the, the trees. And that nice. is our HQ, or at least our, our central operating. And it's also much easier to sneak out, like, I don't know, um, Heavy heavy machinery, secret artifacts. Um, I don't know, like the the, the apocalypse plane <laughs> or whatever. Uh huh. I imagine like there's rumors of all all kind of rumors of weird cryptids and stuff in that area. That um, you know, division sort of fosters the idea that these are just kooky theories about Bigfoot, but in fact are uh, you guys heading in and out of the office? Yeah, and yeah. Area Fifty One exists as a as a distraction. <laughs> Um, so, Drew, what about the division is mundane? There is an office that could be transplanted from any, like, any office building in any middle-sized city, like the, the cubicles and, and the people in suits at the water cooler. Mm -hmm. It looks entirely boring. I love this. And what about Division is Strange? Underneath that office, in the lower levels of the building, is where all the uh, supernatural stuff lives and lies. And uh, it's only separated by one floor, and it gets real weird down there. <laughs> oh. Um. Don, how are the monstrous agents like you treated differently than the human agents? I don't think we're like, we don't get a salary or anything, right? Like there's no employment package to this beyond the, the division gives us a place to live and, you know, some food and, and you know, we'll, we'll uh, fulfill an occasional request for a movie outing or something, maybe. It's outrageous. I want to unionize these monsters already. Um, cool. Uh, and how does the, how does that show in the division structure? Like, does, does that mean that monsters are, are sort of lower ranking or does that mean that we promote the monsters because it's easier if the executives don't actually draw a salary? Like, how does that work? I mean, I almost picture that like we, we don't show up on the, on the organizational chart. Um, though we do get an email address. <laughs> nice. Uh, and John, you had a question from your division move. Do you want to do that now as well? Yeah. So um, this is the psychic invokers. Um, so as a reminder, it says the division has trained a number of psychics to attune to an agent, which would be um, Kronos. And they share their visions across vast distances directly into the mind of an agent in the field. This connection has been deemed to operate within marginally safe parameters most of the time. When you take this move, answer at least one of the following questions. Um, so the questions are, let's see, who is the psychic invoker you have a good relationship with? Who is the psychic invoker you don't always get along with? And why were you chosen to become a psychic link for the division? So I'm definitely going to answer that last one. Um, the why were you chosen? And I think it's because Kronos actually kind of exists in this like ethereal plane or, or is most easily able to 
tied to that. And these psychic invokers send their messages through that plane. Um, actually, I'm just gonna answer all three of these because this will give. I think, I think it'll give you know a couple of NPCs for you to to have and, and build out division. Um, so, who's the psychic invoker that you have a good working relationship with? Uh, let's call her uh, Katiana. And it says, "What is their specialty?" I think that they are. Um, like I want to say like a spy, but I feel like that's maybe too generic in terms of a specialty. Do you think it should be something more specific than that? Uh, I mean, well, can you like tell us more about what spy means in this context? Um, I'm I'm picturing you know someone that like go goes to to cities, uh, goes to you know. Big gala events, uh, undercover, uh, looking for information, digging up leads, right, and reporting back on those, and and you know maybe carries a hidden gun uh, under the dress and can kick ass when needed. Yeah, yeah, that works. Um, and then the last one is who is a psychic invoker you don't always get along with, and why do you put up with them anyway? Um, I, I'm gonna call this one Brad. I hope no one's family members of Brad. I just feel like Brad is such a good jerk name. Uh, so this is Brad. Um, but why do we put up with them anyway? I don't know. Does someone want to be friends with Jerk Brad? I feel like a Sog maybe is friends with Jerk Brad. By the way, apologies to all Brad's watching. Yeah, <laughs> Asad gets along very well with Jerk Brad. Uh, and so <laughs> weirdly, it's, uh, I think I think Asad does not get along well with with almost any mortal staff member of the of the division. Um, but but Asad does like Brad, and and so that's why we put up with Brad because, well, someone can talk to Asad. <laughs> what does Asad appreciate about Brad? I think that Brad, uh, I think that Asag finds Brad very funny, right? Because I think that Asag sort of views Brad uh, as this, I don't think Asag understands why Brad thinks of himself so highly, um, but it, it sort of is, is entertainment for Asag, basically. It's like, it's like watching a clown. I don't, I don't think Brad is aware of that dynamic in their relationship, but that is that is why a sog likes Brad. It's kind of like when someone laughs at a dog because it thinks it's human. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. Um. All right, that's amazing. Sorry, Matthew. I realize that we didn't do your um Alpha and Omega question, but we'll we'll come to, back to that. Uh, I I haven't completely forgotten. Just sort of forgotten. No problem. Um, I've actually uh, considered also instead of choosing Alpha and Omega, if no one wants to volunteer or is interested in that, I can also go with uh, what's this? It's called this is the blood of my covenant. And basically, I'm, I mark one of you as chosen, and I will be regularly creating uh, weapons to wield for that person. Um, and I feel like uh, I feel like Zero or John, uh, sorry, Zero or John, Zero or or Kronos are very good candidates. Although I'm not opposed to um, uh, Asab because I just think it's kind of hilarious to to take this arrogant god and be all like, "Here, my liege." Weapon for you, <laughs> hmm. um, but again, I want to I want to consent under 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 relationship of being marked as chosen. So you 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 definitely want to go with that move rather than Alpha and Omega. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, who who would like to be the chosen one for the the weapons of Sebastian? Yeah, Sog will take them. All the, right, the Sebastian's uh, tokens of worship. Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm marking it down. 
All right. So, uh, Asag, uh, another question for you, just in terms of establishing division a little bit. What area in the HQ that you're all based out of is off limits even to you? Yeah, I think that there is a room that there, there is a, a level that we are not invited to. Um, none of none of the agents are invited to, and I think that in that area of the division headquarters is where they plan to deal with us uh, should anything happen. Right? We we are not viewed as team members. We are viewed as potential threat vectors. Um, so they they do have a just sort of a backup like break glass in case team goes bad that we are not allowed to go near. Mm -hmm. Um, are you the only monsters based out of this particular HQ, or are there other monstrous teams there as well, do you think? I think that probably monsters move around. Um, I, I think that there are certainly much, many, many more monsters working for the Division. Um, we might be the only ones at the HQ at the moment, but probably they are like shuffled around on assignments a lot, right? So there are a lot of like visiting monsters for a couple of months. If everyone else is good with that, I don't want to just like roll over that answer. No, that's good. Um, and I guess a, a question that, that comes up for me, since we established that Division has, you know, lots of locations, is Division, you know, is Division part of the UN? Is it you know, a quasi-governmental organization? Is it a private corporation? Like, what's the sort of standing or status of division? Um, I'm happy for anyone who has an idea about this to, to jump in. Or... I, I would, what do y'all think about, it, it is probably like some government funded organization, but it, I think it probably like dates way back. And at this point is just sort of like, maybe, you know, no one even knows what it means when it shows up on reports anymore, but it gets overlooked a lot, but who knows? Maybe, you know, someone starts poking their nose in and like, what is this division thing? Yeah. I, I think division probably has a very long, it, like it has a very long history in a lot of different forms. I don't think that, I think division is probably like our specific um, iteration of it. But like a hundred years ago, there was, you know, ye olde division doing their stuff. And a hundred years before there was even older division and sort of going back a, a, a surprisingly long time. Yeah, I feel like, I feel like uh, the division is the current name but then back during like Teddy Roosevelt's administration, it was called the Spook House or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it used to it used to be like the Gentleman's Club for monstrous <laughs> encounters. <laughs> um, mm. I guess this is maybe something that we can leave undefined. But I'm curious about whether a surprisingly long time means you know a few hundred years, or if it means back you know before humans walked the earth. Um, Surprisingly long time commit a lot of things when we're talking about, you know, fallen gods and yeah. uh, ancient Greeks and things like that. Would people prefer to define that a little more clearly or do we just want to leave that uh, an open question? Yeah, let's leave it open, I think. I mean, sorry to speak for... <laughs> cool. I think having it vague could be interesting. Be a surprising, surprising amount of time. <laughs> I, I think right. that maybe like the official history of Division is that it came out of some you know, group founded in like the 1700s or whatever. But okay, I, I don't mean there's like an archive that if you look into it, there's a lot of stuff a lot older than that, you know, that mm -hmm. no one likes to talk about. <laughs> I don't mean to get ahead of myself, but you know, like one thing, one juicy story I would like love to see is like the origins of the division or of any kind of agency like this was that 300 years ago, it was a gentleman's club of occultists who accidentally let loose a great evil upon the world. And they're like, oh shit, I guess we're the ones who have to solve it too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they used to be, they you know, they used to be sort of like people tinkering with things beyond their control and the creation of something that tries to harness all that darkness and put it back where it came from, like emerged from that mistake. But look at me, I'm writing already. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and I assume that all of you basically reside at the uh, Division HQ, or do any of you maintain a, a separate residence? I think Zero definitely lives there. I mean, depends. How free are we to maintain separate residences, right? Then again, who can stop us, right? <laughs> well, you don't get paid money, so I think Division could stop you pretty effectively. <laughs> um, money, what does that do to angels and gods? You just, exactly. you just get by with a smile and, <laughs> and charm and mm -hmm. destruction. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Josh, could you tell us a bit about like what does the Sarg's uh, like residence in the HQ look like? Yeah, a Sarg uh, doesn't act. I think that a Sarg has like a bedroom. It is. It it looks like like a monk's cell almost. There's nothing on the wall. Um, the it's just like a plain sheet, like a thin little sheet. Um, I think lots of the time people like to decorate because, you know, they, they don't get paid and they kind of have to live here and they like to make it their own place. Um, but Asag, Asag just goes into this empty room uh, and lies down on a bed and closes their eyes uh, and then gets up eight hours later. They do not have the have a sleep and a rest cycle like a normal person does. And they... They, 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 I think so. at one point, um, division members tried to decorate the room for them, <laughs> uh, and and it was not good. Uh, Asag sort of thought it was a little bit insulting, right? Because it's the Asag took it as as like a shrine, um, but like a insulting shrine. Like, look at what you don't have anymore. Um, and that was that was a big kerfuffle in division. So now Asag just sleeps in their cell almost. <laughs> All right. And what's the first thing Asag does when they wake up in the morning? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Asag gets dressed right, which is not a conscious. It's, it's just whatever is first. Asag does not care for fashion. Um, and then Asag gets out and and they spend a lot of time procrastinating more than you would expect a god to spend. Um, but they don't, they do not like the division, right? They, they sort of accept the division on a, on a, this makes sense for me. I gotta do this. You know, this is, this is the way that the world works. Um, but they, yeah, you, Asag has eternity. Asag does not like mortal life. Uh, and Asag does the jobs that they are forced to um, and that they think will benefit them. Uh, but I think that people avoid Asag because of their force of personality and because uh, in Division literature, there's some warnings like, do not come close to Asag. Asag will create a cult of personality. Um, <laughs> it, it, is, it is very, very... So the agents very strenuously avoid Asag as part of training. Uh, and and it sort of makes a weird dynamic in the actual agency building, even if Asag wanted to be close to them. Aw. Um, are there any sort of mundane pleasures that Asag actually appreciates or, or enjoys, or, or strictly no? Loves TV. Ah, um, nice. Loves TV. The TV is fascinating. Uh, there like like we'll sit and just and just stare at the TV um, do not turn off the TV while a sog is watching TV but is is a very that is a rule that you learn early on <laughs> amazing all right um so let's see zero I'm gonna start with the same question for you tell us about zero's sort of living quarters or, or residence zero's room is pretty simple not not quite the spartan monk like cell but um it's a bed and i think an like a, an old timey record player and a shelf full of books and he spends most of his days 
reading or sleeping. Nice. What sort of music does he play on the old timey record player? I think hmm, he really likes like Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong, like classic stuff that's more, uh, or I guess romantic and, and earnest than is necessarily fashionable. Nice. Um, why are you still recovering from the last investigation that you went out on? Last time they went out on an investigation, he had to use his ability to uh, travel through portals that connect dreamers. And they, or he saw something very just traumatizing, horrible in there. And uh, he hasn't been able to shake it. It's, it's uh, like a recurring nightmare that just lingers. Has he told anyone about that? I don't think so. Right. He's just been off for a few weeks. Okay, so people people maybe have noticed that you're a bit off? I, th I think so, yeah. More than usual. All right. Uh, Kronos, I would love to hear about your living quarters. Yeah, Kronos' living quarters, there is no bed because Kronos doesn't sleep. Um, all that Kronos really has is there's a rack of suits that all look exactly the same. And Kronos has a couple of old, like the like brick, huge laptops, and then a stack of books. And you can see they've... There's also a just spread of paper beside them where they've been working through notes of their own writing, going through all these books and a and hundred tabs open. They are a tab porter for sure. Nice. All right, I'm not sure if you said this earlier, but can you tell us a bit about what your suit looks like? Are your suits? I think the, the suits get an update every decade or so um, as you know it becomes apparent that Cronus has fallen out of fashion and so at this point they are um, they're, they're pretty 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 fashionable like a, a light blue gray um, double double button two button um, jacket white shirt and a modest tie, probably just like a, a nice, um, let's say it's like a, hmm, let's say a lilac color. And I mean, when they, when they, you know, wear the suit, there is, there is also I'm I'm thinking that they probably have yeah a uh, some sort of cloth you know face covering that they pull on over gloves um, so that way there's you know the, the the human shape that can be seen yeah the um what what color are the the those masks and gloves like or is there a pattern on them or Ooh, yeah, I, the gloves are um, not Hawaiian, like like a yeah, like a Polynesian sort of flower print, and I think the mask itself is is yeah, just a, like an off white. Um, I do love to picture the preceding decades versions of this outfit. Uh, I imagine the the Polynesian print on the gloves to have been consistent across like flowy '90s suits and you know boxy '80s suits and all. Yeah, the gloves have been around for a long time. The the you know the division interns tried to tell Kronos that it's time to update the the gloves too, and he said no. The, the suit's mm -hmm. fine, but the, I, I like these gloves. These gloves have been through a lot. Yeah. 
Um, and there's one division agent, maybe it's uh, Katiana or it could be someone else, who's sort of taken a liking to you. Um, what have the two of you been doing to spend time together? I think we play chess. Um, yeah, and I let's say it's Katiana when she's in town. She always comes and we play chess. Nice. Um, who wins? Katiana wins, and Kronos will say it's because, you know, he lets her. Because he's had forever to study the game, but he could win if he wanted to. I mean, she's psychic. That's going to be a significant advantage in a game of chess. That's true. <laughs> well, um, all right. And Sebastian, tell us about your living quarters. Ah, my living quarters, Sebastian's living quarters, are a mess. They are a sty. Um, you got uh, several shelves, you know, filled with stuff, with, with you know, with books, uh, you know, uh, old uh, vinyl records, 8-track tapes, you know, compact disc, <laughs> cassette. It's just, you know, a complete uh, mess of uh, memorabilia and, 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 and music. Music is his, uh, is his passion. But also, um, he's got a long table, which I guess you know you can't tell whether it was a desk or a, or a, or, a, or you know like a dining table at one point. It's just covered with so much stuff. And from there, you know, there's stacks of paper all over. And whenever you come in to visit Sebastian, he's always got. He doesn't just have music playing, but he's always like maybe on, on many days he's wearing just a fuzzy bathrobe. And he's just walking around, just drinking and smoking while listening to music, and occasionally dabbling in hard drugs. And if that was a, if that was like, a, a, you know, a line for some people, let me know. We don't. It's not essential to the character, but yeah, uh, he has he has descended into in in these eternal years. He has descended into, you know, hedonism, which he claims is just you know his intellectual curiosity. <laughs> um, as you said, music is his passion. What does he like to listen to? Um, when he's expecting guests, or not guests, or visitors, he uh, likes to do the old, like, play the evil man opera music. But, you know, his tastes are very, very um, diverse. Um, he'll dance to, to house. He'll, you know, he'll listen to rap. Uh, everything covered. In fact, I'll try to find a way to weave in that eclecticness into my play of the character. Right. Um, are, are your superiors in Division either aware of or concerned about your hedonism and drug use? Um, let's see. They're, they'd cluck their tongue at it, um, but as far as they can tell, it's not really impaired my ability to do the job. But nobody likes division money, like financing, <laughs> <laughs> financing, you know, the drug problem in America or anywhere else, actually. <laughs> so let's, be, so let's be honest, the cocaine money is going to the CIA anyway. <laughs> exactly. The, um, all right, so, but so. From one division to another division. <laughs> So maybe Division is like keeping a sort of close eye on whether this may begin to impair you, whether they'll have to bring up some of that that stuff from the special room that none of you are allowed into. Um, interesting. All right. So, look, I think that we're about good to kick off our first mystery. So let's just take a short break, um, come back about three minutes past the hour. We'll talk very briefly about some rule stuff, and then we'll just uh, get playing. Um, thanks very much, everyone. I think I need to make a, a slight amendment to what's in Zero's room. Uh, how so? I think instead of the books, I think he'll have a like a, a desk and a whole bunch of, of clay. He sculpts little clay figures. Nice. Um, humans, monsters, what, what does he sculpt exactly? Usually 
uh, I think usually humans, uh, but if some image is stuck in his head from a dream or, or a mission they were on, he'll he'll sculpt that, try and get it out. Mm -hmm. um, so has he been, uh, it, it makes me think of um, Close Encounters, the, uh, everyone sculpting the, the image oh, from yes. the, in mashed potato and things. The, um, right. So has he been uh, working out his sculpting muscles after his recent dream portal trauma? Oh, I think so. I think there's a lot more just pieces of his work around, and he, he probably leaves them around the, the common areas too. Nice. Um, so we are going to get into a mystery. I just want to briefly talk about the sort of central mechanic of the game so that that's clear for everyone. So it's basically a PBTA game. I assume that everyone's played Out by the Apocalypse games before. Um, but the uh, the ranges, the result ranges are slightly different. And obviously your characters don't have stats. So um, instead of stats, for all your basic moves and most of your playbook moves, um, you have a resource called darkness tokens. Uh, when you make uh, a basic move, you decide how many to spend, and each darkness token that you spend adds plus one to your roll. So you can add as many or as few as you want. Um, when you get the result, on an eight to ten, you're going to use your powers with precision and control to do what you wanted to do. Um, if you roll an 11 plus, you will have gone too far or lost control in some way or on a seven minus, you will have fallen short in some way. So it's about trying to hit that sweet spot in the middle when you roll. Um, you can use your bonds as well to modify the result after you've rolled it. So you choose in advance how many darkness tokens you're gonna to spend. And then after you've rolled, you can use a bond to add plus one or subtract minus one uh, from the result. The each playbook has five ways that you can gain darkness tokens. So make sure you're kind of familiar with that part of your playbook. Um, four of them will be specific to your playbook. And then the one that you all share is to embody a condition that you have. Um, conditions being the kind of emotional harm that you can suffer in the game, similar to masks or other games that you might have played. When you hit one of those triggers uh, for dark for gaining darkness tokens, you can choose how many that you take, um, any number from two to four. Uh, however, if you have five or more darkness tokens, uh, you trigger a mechanic called Torn Between, where you are torn between what the darkness demands of you and your mission. Uh, and that's a sort of move sequence that we'll, we'll go into if any of you have more than five tokens, or five or more. Um, you do have a chance, if you accumulate five or more tokens and you make a move immediately, you can just spend them. Um, it, you know, So you can just rack up those tokens in advance of a move if that's what you want to do. The, um, I, I'm definitely not going to remember what all of your triggers for gaining darkness tokens are, so just let us know if you're, um, if you're trying to trigger one of those. Um, you, you are welcome to keep track of that stuff. Uh, ruin moves are different. You generally mark one ruin to use a, a ruin move, or the, the move will tell you how it works. Um, when you accumulate five ruin, you will gain another ruin advance. Um, we presumably won't trigger this mechanic in a four session run, but it ultimately, if you accumulate enough ruin advances, you yourself become a harbinger of the apocalypse and uh, try to bring about the end of the world. Um, that, I think that's enough for us to like go with. Obviously, we'll talk more about the mechanics as we sort of play through them. But uh, are there any questions about that? All right, cool. So as we start the today's mystery, you're all on a helicopter. It's a pretty bumpy ride. You're flying into Manila and there are very heavy rain and winds all around you. The city's been battered recently by typhoons of unusual ferocity. And this, this weather isn't quite a typhoon, but it might feel like one to, to those of you who haven't sort of lived around tropical uh, areas before. The spot that you're flying into is just called the apartments. 
It's a pair of tower blocks that were built back in the 60s, uh, intended as temporary housing for migrant workers, but they turned out uh, obviously to be less temporary than originally intended. Uh, these days, there are still some, you know, sort of generational uh, families from those from back in the 60s still living there, but mostly the human workers have moved out, and monsters who often struggle to find housing in the world have moved in. There's lots of different kinds of monsters living in the building, but the biggest population uh, in the apartments are the Manan the Mananungal. Mananungal can disguise themselves as humans. They have many genders, but to humans, they often read as female or feminine. They're not exactly nocturnal, but the, the heat of the Philippines tends to make them more sluggish during the day and more active at night. And when they feel safe and comfortable, they will often extend their wings that they otherwise keep hidden. They tend to be about six feet across. When they're feeling really safe, they like to leave their legs behind and just fly off uh, into the night to go exploring, to visit friends or family, uh, things like that. But the Mananangal have not been saved recently. Over the last month, three of the Mananangal residents of the apartments have been murdered. And at first, you know, they were thought just to have flown off and maybe gotten busy with something and not come back straight away. Uh, friends and neighbours would find their abandoned lower bodies in their apartments. But more recently, their upper bodies have actually been found out on the streets, uh, horribly rent and dismembered. And Division has identified that a harbinger of the apocalypse is at work. Uh, connected to a door. And this is your fundamental work as monstrous agents of division, to find where these apocalyptic doors may be opening, uh, to identify the door uh, and to, to prevent it from being opened and to shut down that harbinger. The door itself could be anything. It, it could be a literal door. Uh, it could be an object. It could be a person. Uh, the, there's no particular shape or structure to what a door may look like. But your job here will be to find out what that door is and to make sure that it doesn't open uh, onto the end of the world. Your contact at the apartments is Sister Pat, uh, who is a former division agent turned nun. Um, when she left division, she claimed that she was leaving because she had found God. But you, Asag, know that this is not true. Why did she really come back to the Philippines? Uh, um, hmm. You know, I think that, uh, frankly, in economic reasons, you know, cost of living is cheaper in the Philippines. Uh, and and you know as as sort of you know egg, uh fuck i like like people who are shitheads and vacation constantly in the global south um but that is that is the plan to to sort of live a, a slightly a life that is a little bit out of their economic class in the philippines yeah right um why are the two of you still close uh, well, you know, it's not a good person thing to do, but gods are not generally good people. Yeah. Cool. Um, and let's see, Kronos, you were here years, if not decades ago. Um, as you fly into the city, how do you recognize that things have changed for the worse? I think Kronos is just remembering the last time they saw it. And at that point, the streets looked new. The buildings had a nice shine to them and, and fresh coats of paint. And there was, you know, healthy vegetation and, and green trees and things around. And now flying in, you can see that the streets are falling apart. The buildings 
you know, look in similar shape. Um, a lot of the plant life has just disappeared and been taken over by, you know, other other things. Maybe maybe even like piles of trash or, you know, knocked down um, some some of the buildings knocked down or something like that. Um, and which of the Mananangal is waiting for you, eager for a reunion? Um, do we have a list of Mononongal names by chance? <laughs> um, we don't particularly, they have human type names. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me jump over. Uh, Bill A. Be, sorry. I just wanted to make a suggestion. If you want to be like setting, uh, um, uh, setting specific, you just choose any good, uh, Christian name and that <laughs> usually works in the Philippines, but you lean towards, uh, Spanish ones. So you're 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 thinking I can think of one of those. Um, yeah, off the top of my head, like for example, for me, I would have I'd go with Ines or something like that, or Carmen or whatever. I like Ines. That sounds nice. Okay, tell us a bit about Ines. Um, you said they're waiting. They're they're um, waiting for you, eager for a reunion. Eager for a reunion. Okay. Um, I think Ines is a community organizer, and right, and and like. Um, was here when I was here years ago, and, and that's how we how we met. Um, you know, division was here to like help establish this community, and S was going to be kind of the local organizer to um, advocate for Mononongo rights and everything. And so uh, we formed a, a, a good friendship at the time, and I can imagine, given the way things have trended. Probably they're probably eager eager to see uh, some more support coming back. Yeah, right. All right. So the helicopter comes in to the the roof um, of one of the the two towers. Uh, you can see Sister Teresa um, sort of huddled under under some shelter away from the rain, uh, smoking. Um, Asag, you remember she smokes pretty constantly. She has a, a sort of cheeky grin and knowing eyes and her her nun's habit is a little wrinkled. Um, she, you know, as your, your helicopter touches down, she waves you all across to, you know, come in out of the rain, uh, starts leading you inside the building. Um, just want to flag that all of you are going to need to start accumulating darkness tokens at some point so that you can make moves. Obviously, you can just roll them raw without any darkness tokens, but um, just uh, feel free to, to jump in any time that you want to trigger one of your your darkness token sort of acquisition moves. Um, but Sister Teresa is going to lead you down to her apartment. See that it's you know it's pretty humble and cramped. Um, Asag, you definitely see that you know if her goal in moving here was to to sort of live above her her station uh, in the states, it it hasn't worked out for her. Um, there's a crucifix on the wall. There's an old family photo, uh, some newspaper clippings that maybe reflect her time with division, uh, a bit yellowed. She sits you all down, um, gets out some whiskey, and asks who would like. Uh, Sebastian takes it immediately. <laughs> and uh, Kronos... You know, you see the the mask, right? Turn, turn, especially Sebastian. Please do do pace yourself. <laughs> and and I, I'm gonna go ahead and flag that that is me um, asking someone to follow my instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, uh, just one on the hour every hour. <laughs> I. Can't expect much better from you. That's that's fine. Sister Teresa maybe looks a little disappointed that you're going to moderate yourself to that extent. Um, you know, she's been saving the good stuff for someone who'd appreciate it, but she pours some out. Um, Asag, you, it sounds like you don't really go for earthly uh, pleasures like this. Is that? Uh, you know, if I think that if Asag is handed a glass, Asag is going to drink it. Um, okay. 
like it's like it's water, basically. <laughs> There's the sock does not react to the the harshness of alcohol at all. Um, yeah. You know whether they notice it. I don't know if anyone has asked. So. <laughs> I also want to say that Sebastian looks for like the really wide glasses. <laughs> Nice. Uh, and Zero? Is Zero going to have a drink? I think he'll he'll watch Sebastian kind of curiously and then just kind of hesitantly accept it and, and sniff it uncertainly and kind of look around and see a sog and then take a, a gentle sip and just immediately just like his whole face scrunches up. <laughs> You see the the disappointment from Sister Teresa immediately. Um, well, maybe I maybe I didn't need to save the good stuff after all. Yeah, we should we should talk business, I suppose. Thank thank you all for coming. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how much division have told you, but uh, there have been three three victims so far, three murders that we know of. Uh, all residents of these two buildings. I've kept it pretty quiet so far. I don't want, you know, I don't want the Mananungal to panic. I don't want, you know, the humans outside to get the idea that there's something dangerous happening here. This has always been such a, a peaceful community. Everyone's always been so, well, so safe here and, until now. Yeah. But yeah, three victims. Uh, Samantha Reyes, Lily Bautista, and Jin. Uh, all of them, uh, you know, it, it, I mean, she reiterates what you've already heard. They uh, originally were found just their, their lower bodies in their apartments, but eventually their upper bodies were found sort of dismembered uh, outside. Is there anything that you want to ask her about the what's been happening uh would there be any reason why uh uh why they would have to be gone for so long um what is it that the men and girls need uh what does everyone here needs that requires such long travel or long time spent away <laughs> i'm in mean, nothing in particular most of the men and have have jobs but you know, generally they walk to them. They need their human bodies for that. Um, I couldn't really tell you specifically. The um, There's a couple of Mananungal in the building who might be able to help you out more than I can. Uh, Emily Santos was dating Samantha. She can probably tell you more about her. And uh, let's see. Georgie was good friends with Jin. Might be able to, to help you out there. And no, I suppose if you really want to, you could talk to Urduja. Uh, they're an elder here. They know a lot about everyone's business. Um, I can also, you know, I can show you to the, the victim's apartments if that's helpful. Uh, I mean, I can show you around really anywhere that you want to go. Did the victims have any connection to each other? Nothing that I've been able to, to find, but, you know, I'm, I'm not a trained investigator like you all. Has there been any, any, any others coming into the community lately? People that don't live here and maybe have been antagonizing others? I mean, there's always people moving in and out, but I, I haven't heard of anything in particular. But I, again, I think Adujo would probably be the best person to, to ask about that. Um, can you, can, sorry. Uh... Perhaps we can go visit the uh, apartments and uh, see what's what. Maybe oh. we'll find some clues uh, as to the nature of their departure and their failure to return. 
Of course. Um, mm-hmm. Shall I? Shall I take you all down? Uh, Sebastian nods. All right. So, Sister Teresa will um, lead you down. She'll ask if there's any particular order that you want to see the the apartments in, um, but otherwise, she'll lead you to. Uh, Jin's apartment, which is both the, the closest and the most recent uh, of the victims. Um, so, again, it's a it's a small, cramped apartment that she leads you into. Um, she seems to have a you know she has a key that seems to uh, you know a huge ring of keys that she sort of rifles through, and eventually finds the one that unlocks this room. Um, inside, it, it looks pretty much as you'd expect. Um, it, it looks like it hasn't been occupied for a, for at least a few days. Um, you're welcome to start looking for clues, start investigating. Um, there is a basic move called, I think, grasping keys. That is the one that you use to look for clues. All right. Yeah, I'll try to um, I'll try to grasp some keys, even though no, I'll say that Sebastian, uh, looking at the at the situation and uh, is feeling a little bit uh, numb to the situation. That might be, you know, he can't tell whether that's the effect of the alcohol kicking in or the fact that um, he doesn't really he doesn't really feel a connection to the crime right now. So mm-hmm. that will give him one darkness token. So you can choose two to four darkness tokens. Uh, you can't take one. Oh, all right. Let's go with let's go with the middle road three. I think that's how one for each crime, one for each murder. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. And how how are you going to search for clues here? Mm, I think. What Sebastian will do is try to read the energies and hearts of mortal persons uh, using his angelic powers. So mortal persons, like you're sort of reaching out through the apartment building or to Sister Teresa in particular? or Through the apartment building. Okay. Um, All right. Well, how many darkness tokens will you spend? I will spend two. I right. see. That's a 2d6 plus two. Hope I have the right room. Uh, and we got a 13. That's, um, yeah, okay. So uh, here we go. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> Let's see. On an 11 plus, you uncover a key, but there's a significant complication, cost, or fallout, and the keeper will tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> do you want to do you want to spend bonds to reduce that down towards 10? Hmm. Maybe not now. Let's see some. Let, let's see something. Let's see something wild. Yeah. Yeah. I All right. <laughs> um, before I get to the result of that, I'm just going to check in with the others. Um, you, you all see Sebastian, you know, I think like you've seen him do this before. You recognize the, the signs of him sort of reaching out psychically around the building. What do the rest of you do? Um, zero? I think having seen this before and presumably having seen how this can go wrong, um, I think he is going to kind of back away and maybe, maybe back out into the hall being scared. (laughs) Okay. Um, What does Kronos do? Kronos sets to investigating the scene with a cold and impartial uh, practice just immediately opening drawers and things that are, you know, are clearly of personal nature. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like there's no point in spending time like looking in the kitchen. Like, 
there's never anything in the kitchen. It's always like in the bedroom, you know, under the mattress, in the nightstand, those okay. types of places. And so um, I'm going to call this out as reacting with cold reason and logic. Is sure. That that? Yeah. Um, how many tokens do you take? Um, I'm going to take two, which actually puts me at five. And now I'm realizing I've got to spend tokens because if I end at five after a move, yes. I haven't made a move yet, so I'm okay. So do you, well, but you need to make a move now or it's going to trigger anyway. Do you want to grasp oh, for it? keys? Then yes, I will grasp for keys, yeah. All right. Um, how many tokens do you want to spend? Um, let's just spend one. Okay. Well, go ahead and roll 2d6 plus one. There you go. Nice. On an 8 to 10, you uncover a key. The keeper will tell you what it is. Um, all right. I will come back to you in just a sec with what the, the key is. But Asag, what do you do while this is happening? Yes. Asag is... Asag is... Uh gonna the song is actually not going to this apartment I, I don't think oh, okay. um, a sog is going to go for Emily Santos the uh, the the, mm -hmm. the the woman who's in the relationship with the victim yeah uh, sure. and a sog wants to, to meet with Emily and sort of learn about her. But I'm also happy to say that that can go once we learn what the keys are. No, let's, let's, know, let's play that out a little bit. So um, Sister Teresa will have given you directions to Emily's apartment. Um, you knock on the door and it's opened by a sort of sleepy looking woman with uh, purple hair cut at odd angles. Uh, soft eyes that glow red in the dark and quite intricate tattoos. She looks at you. I mean, your your face is covered in eyes, right? Like she's. Uh. Y yes, my face is covered in eyes. Yeah, but I guess you know she lives in a monstrous building. She's she's probably not that surprised about it. Um, so she's. Uh, pretty unflustered as she says yes. Can you know? Can I help you? Yeah, Asag uh, looks at her very um, intensely, uh, and and says, "No, I can help you." <laughs> yeah, and and then she just sort of walks into the apartment. <laughs> Um, Emily, you know, steps back, cocks her head, trying to figure out what exactly is, is happening here. Um, and then, you know, sort of resignedly just says, well, come on in and shuts the door behind you. What, what is it exactly that you're going to help me with? I know about, uh, Samantha? Was the mm -hmm. I, I know about Samantha. Uh, she says she does not say it with the uh, bedside manner that you know someone might want. Um, she says, "I'm here to help you. I'm here to find out who did it, and I'm here to stop them. But I need your help." Uh, well, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's, it's, did something happen to Samantha? And then Asag, uh, now now Asag is a little uh, concerned. <laughs> uh, so Asag says, you didn't know? Didn't know what? I'm very sorry. Uh, and she is lying there. That is a lie. She actually <laughs> feels... She, she feels others are beneath her right now. Um, 
So I'm going to give myself three tokens. Nice. Uh, she, yeah. And, and she says, I'm sorry. Um, and I think that I, I, she's good at lying. So Emily does not know that it is a lie. But uh, yeah. it, is, it is very much a lie. She is not sorry for this, for this girl. Um, and, she, and she says, uh, I know this is difficult for you, but I need your help. And we want to stop this. If there is anything you learn, come tell me. Uh, and then she's gonna give her a little business card, something. <laughs> Not a business card. She's gonna give her, you know, like a, a token of worship, um, because this is also, I think, a call me master right now on Emily, which is uh, also again a little bit fucked up. But she's kind of a fucked up person. Um, so I am gonna. Do 2d6 plus 2. And that is an 8, which is wonderful. So, um, so on an 8 to 10, I have claimed new worshippers. Uh, the, the, you know, this, this was a very traumatic moment for Emily, I'm afraid, learning about. Uh, Samantha's death and sort of being exposed to uh, Asag. But there is something about Asag that is irresistible, right? Even in this like weird, uh, you know, confrontational, um, the pushy, you know, condescending Asag, there is something about Asag that is absolutely irresistible. Um, something, something. And and as a result, uh, they fulfill a single command exactly as I wish, which is that they will report back to me with, you know, whatever Emily learns when she actually investigates her unfortunately murdered girlfriend. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, Emily uh, is extremely shaken by, by what you said. Uh, her knees, you know, buckle a little. But then ultimately, she just uh, lets herself fall to her knees in a, a, a pose of sort of supplication and worship before Asag. Um, and says, yes, I, I will tell you anything. And do, is Asag just going to leave her there? or uh, Asag gives her a pat on the head <laughs> before she leaves. Asag is not used to this. You know, As Asag doesn't like having to deal with also having a mortal body and supplicants. So he doesn't. It's difficult. You know, when you're when you're just a god, people bow down to you, and you're up there in heaven somewhere. You know, to worry about actually dealing with them afterwards. Sure. Um, but now Asag has to walk out of the room, and it is and it is a little bit awkward when Asag <laughs> uh Emily there in the, you know, like kneeling alone in the room. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kronos, you sort of were searching in a very logical fashion, um, and what you find under the bedspread, like, you know, tucked away, sort of hidden beneath the mattress, is an old set of rusty keys. Um, each of them is just inscribed in Bebeyan, which is an ancient writing system, well, maybe you don't necessarily recognize it? I mean, I guess Kronos has been around long enough to maybe recognize ancient writing systems. What do you think? Um, I think at least to the extent that you can tell, like, this is very old. I don't know that you mm -hmm. would be able to read it per se. Yeah. Yeah, so that that's what you get then, an old set of rusty keys inscribed in an ancient language. And the way the keys work in this game, it's it's similar to Brindlewood Bay. It's the same sort of mechanic. You acquire these clues from investigating, and when you have enough of them, you'll be able to roll a theorized type move. Uh, I think it's called unlocking Doom's door um, to 
resolve the mystery. There's a tab on the character keeper called Keys and Doomsday Clock. Uh, and you can, I'll put in the name of the mystery if I can find it. And you can start recording the, the keys that you've collected there. So you said it was a set of rusty keys. Inscribed um, in an ancient language. Inscribed in an ancient language. Uh, and I'll just let you know, this is a complexity six mystery. And just like Brindlewood Bay, when you roll to figure out the solution, to figure out what Doom's Door is, where it is, who the Harbinger is, you'll roll the number of keys you've collected minus the difficulty. Um, so at this point, you have one key, so you'd be rolling at minus five, which presumably you will not want to do. But uh, that's the, the, the way the mechanic works. The, um, now, uh, I thought it would be more efficient to run a game off some paper notes for a change, and it's turned out that I am not more comfortable off the screen. Bear with me for one sec. So, Sebastian, tell us what it feels like for you or what it looks like to other people when you sort of reach out psychically. Um, I think what happens is uh, Sebastian is holding the whiskey glass and sort of, like, uh, rubbing his finger around it as, uh, as a sort of focus, and he gets lost in a state of reverie um, as he feels the energy, his divine energy, just like pulsing out, you know, from him and ping, and letting that energy ping back to him. Um, sort of like, <clears throat> sort of like the way that the energy of the gods like reaches out to touch man and feeds, you know, gods back with you know the energy of, of 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 humanity and so that's that's sort of like the vibe the energy that the yeah. flow that allows them to connect with one another yeah so you start to gather impressions you know at first very banal ones um unremarkable everyday thoughts of the the people and monsters living around you in the building um, but the impressions start to settle around imagery of insects. You know, first, you know, you notice a fly, you notice that someone's perceived a, a cockroach somewhere, someone sees a spider. Um, quickly, th this imagery starts to become overwhelming. Uh, it's not just isolated insects, it's huge swarms of insects, infestations of insects, and wherever they go, uh, clicking and hissing, they leave trails of blood and gore behind them. And what uh, Zero and Kronos and Sister Teresa all see is that these teeming hordes of insects begin to pour from your mouth, your nose, your ears, erupting into the real world in the room around you uh, as the impressions overwhelm you. Uh, and that is where we will finish up for this week. The key that you got there was an infestation of insects, um, just to record on the on the tab. I just want to say uh, I, I have no problems with this, absolutely, but I hope nobody was, like, you know, troubled by the insectile imagery. <laughs> cool. Um, so now we have some end-of-session questions that will decide how much XP each of you gets. Um, for today. Um, so the first one is, um, did you express your monstrous nature and or express your humanity? Uh, if yes, mark one XP. I'm happy for you just to decide the answers for yourselves. If you have any questions or, or doubts or you want to talk about it, feel free. Um, yeah, I will definitely express humanity by, you know, um, really giving in to the, the drink. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that uh, I expressed my monstrous nature by yeah, I, I, forcing I, a grieving <laughs> young woman to become my worshiper. Yes. What um, doubt was there? No doubt. What doubt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. The second question is: Did you learn something significant about yourself? and or your impending ruin? Uh, if yes, mark one XP. Um, 
Like, I think for this, you know, we didn't get to do a whole lot of actual role play. You are welcome to just consider that the character creation process was a way of learning something significant about yourselves. Um, All right. I was going to say no, but if you want, it's just on us checking that off. I'll definitely do that. Um, did you learn something significant about a fellow monster? If yes, mark one XP. Oh, I wish I did, but I did not. And the last one, uh, this one is not for XP, but did you uncover at least one key of the apocalypse or attempt to unlock a doom's door? If you did not, mark one ruin. Uh, and ruin accumulates towards further ruin advances. Uh, so wait, let me let me get that advances. straight backwards. Because, uh, if I found a key, I avoid ruin. Yes. Got it. Um, cool. And then to finish up, I'd love to just do a quick round of stars and wishes. Um, let's go left to right across the uh, character keeper again. So, Matthew, do you want to lead off with stars and wishes? Yeah. Um, you know, just jumping in straight into the adventure with the hour that we had, I thought, you know, uh, it kicked off very well um, in terms of uh, evocating the atmosphere. And uh, my other star is um, the characters um, that have been created. You know, um, today I felt, you know, I, I you know, uh, I'm, I'm inclined to think in two ways, uh, magnanimously that everybody here is just awesome at creating characters that, you know, really, really ratchet up the drama. And I'd also like to think that it's maybe speaks well to the system or the character creation's tendency to just invite that drama and that intensity. So, you know, that was a definitely like definite plus point for me today. Any wishes? Mm. Chaos, destruction, prophecy, omens. I'm waiting for it. Can't wait. Can't wait to just go full speed ahead into, you know, ruin, doom, and drama. <laughs> I, I love that your character is currently just vomiting, teeming hordes of mystical insects from the void, and you're like, I want some chaos. Like... <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, thank you. Drew? Um, I should say also that I... I marked two tokens when he reacted with cowardice by backing out of the room. I forgot to actually vocalize that. But uh, uh, stars, yeah, uh, all the the characters were great. It was fun to to build the characters together and get those uh, bonds. Uh, but a particular star to Asag and Samantha. That was uh, that was very Asag. So the, that was. Great. Um, wishes. Uh, nothing in particular. I'm, I'm looking forward to just digging more into this and seeing what comes next. Thanks. Um, John? Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, you know seeing everyone's characters get created and the start of them. I'm very intrigued by all of them and excited to you know see them come to even more fruition as we play more. I think uh, also definitely star for the ending insects, you know, pouring out of the mouth thing. I am I am totally on board for like, you know, that sort of stuff, gross, you know, skeevy kind of, ugh, make your skin crawl. I love that stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm good with that. I think for wishes, um, my wish is, uh, uh, it, it's a bit of a, of a, a Quest to the other players, I'll say like I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of playing with the tortured romance side of this game, but I know from my past playing experience, I am not good at the, as a player at bringing those things into games. Um, I don't; it just doesn't seem to happen when it's left to my devices. So if that's something that you're interested in as well, um, just know that if you want to initiate a scene that involves that, I'm definitely up for it, and I will I will jump in but I'm sometimes not great at initiating them myself. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and Josh? Yeah, I loved the session. I thought it was great. I loved getting to know all of our characters. Um, I'm very excited to see uh, 
to, to get to the bottom of this mystery. Wishes, um, I would I would love to see more uh, intercharacter character interaction. Sorry, uh, intercharacter interaction. Right? I, I we have we have these very interesting player characters, and uh, I'd I'd love to talk to each other. Right? That'd be fun. Uh, yeah. Sorry. No, you're sorry. Sorry. Please, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 no. I'm not, that wasn't me. It was your. It was your turn. But go ahead. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm very excited for the next session. I'm excited to see. Uh. You know what we what we figure out is the root cause of of these murders, and I'm excited to get to know these characters even better. So. Um, I just want to yeah. say I'm very ex excited to see more of Zero. Uh, to, uh, next, I felt like uh, Zero um, was a little bit more like receded into the background, and, uh, if only uh, uh, a combination of the nature of the character as well as the uh, limited time frame that we had. But you know, definitely, like you know, I am, like, I am, you know, excited. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I definitely expect that everyone will get more spotlight time next time when we actually have a, a whole session to play with. And mm -hmm. yeah, I am. I love all of these characters and how uh, excessive they all are. It's fantastic, <laughs> and I'm really excited to to keep playing. So, uh, thanks very much, everyone. I'm going to end the recording now.